This came along, I think, in 2014. Uh, this was a, a paper that was at, in the Boston, you know, a research paper that was uh, pointed out in the Boston Globe by uh, Nathan, um, <laughs> where he had driven uh, the streets of Boston with a high-precision natural gas analyzer and found over 3,000 gas leaks. And up until that point, heat had been working on energy efficiency and had not looked at natural gas in any way. But there was one line in this paper that said that the amount of gas emitted basically erased all of the state's energy efficiency programs. And those were just in from the gas leaks in Boston alone. So um, good evening. Welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. I'm Bob Perry, the museum's executive director, as you now have learned. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome two distinct audiences to tonight's Mill Talk being delivered by Ms. Audrey Shulman. Uh, our in-person audience here at the museum, it's nice to be back from COVID, and our online audience who will take this all in in the future, and you can also re-experience the talk on YouTube coming soon. Um, I want to thank the Lowell Institute for their generous support of our Mill Talk series. Uh, you may or may not know, but this mill was founded by Francis Cabot Lowell. I should wait for applause for the Lowell Institute. Thank you, Bob. Um, Francis Cabot Lowell and partners founded this mill back in 1813. And it was 1822 when a near replica of this mill was constructed in East Chelmsford, Mass., which is now known as Lowell, Massachusetts. So, you know, the tree of life of American industry, certainly of the textile industry in New England, burst through the ground on this site. And it was the people here who were responsible for the explosive growth of textile mills and railroads and banks and insurance companies, you know, the entire web of, of infrastructure support for uh, the growing industrialization of the United States really originated on this site. So that's a little bit of history about where you are. Um, the Lowell Institute was established in 1836 by a bequest of half of the estate of John Lowell Jr. John Lowell Jr. was um, oddly named. He was Francis Cabot Lowell's firstborn son. So he, he named his son after his dad. So f it's, uh, it's crazy. We, um, they, they've been uh, supporting uh, free lectures at esteemed venues throughout the city that you would know, like the Museum of Fine Arts, the Boston Public Library, the Museum of Science, the JFK Library, the Old South Meeting House, and they added us as their uh, most recent partner a handful of years ago. And um, it's amazing to think that that the funding that makes this lecture series possible comes from the wealth generated on this site two centuries ago. It's just, it's an amazing closed loop that doesn't happen very often. Um, a couple housekeeping items for you here tonight. There is uh, plastic bottled water in that box on that table over there. If you do get thirsty, we gotta figure out how to do that better. Um, you'll also find restrooms. Uh, if you go to that black car, turn right and then left, there's a ramp and there are restrooms at the top of the ramp. I also have a microphone here, a wireless mic to pass around during the Q&A at the end of the talk. We want to do that if you want your voice registered on the recording. If you don't, then no one will hear what you asked. Um, so it's important to remember that, be patient, pass it around, and um, that way we'll have a complete record of tonight uh, and the, and the, and the Q&A that follows. So I'm not here to introduce tonight's speaker, but I am here in addition to welcoming you to the museum to introduce Boston University Professor Nathan Phillips, who with me is co-curating our Mill Talk series this year. Um, our theme for 2023, and the first time we've elected to curate a series with the unifying theme is climate, energy, infrastructure, and justice. And tonight's talk gets us started. Uh, professor of Earth and Environment at BU, uh, his research uh, focuses on physiological mechanisms that regulate water, carbon, and energy exchanges between plants and ecosystems and the environment, especially in the context of environmental change. More recently, this research has been translated to studies of the ecology in cities and the ecology of cities in an interdisciplinary research program called Urban Metabolism, supported by the National Science Foundation and Boston University's Sustainable Neighborhood Laboratory. Ladies and gentlemen, to introduce tonight's speaker, it's my great privilege to welcome 
co-curator of our 2023 Mill Talk series, Professor Nathan Phillips. Well, thanks for coming out. And my story is that I live about a mile and a half upstream, up the river from, from here. And I've become a groupie in this museum, is, is my word for it. Uh, just uh, really from the work that I've done in uh, climate, energy, and infrastructure on the gas infrastructure system, and then to be in this environment and to see our past, to learn how we might be able to do things better in the future by learning from innovations in the past. And so when Bob uh, mentioned this theme of infrastructure, climate, energy, and justice, and we started thinking about speakers who could speak to this issue, right to the front of my mind came our speaker, Audrey Shulman. And I'm not going to go into depth because I could be talking all night and my job is to turn the floor over, but just to say that, that Audrey really is an innovator, uh, a visionary, a doer, um, and has really taken a, a status quo utility system, which is very entrenched, and managed with her wonderful team at HEAT to innovate in a way that the change is actually happening. And it's very exciting. And so I'm gonna just turn it over to Audrey and uh, take it away. Thank you. So I'm short, there we go. Um, so today I thought I'd talk about, since we're in an innovation museum, a little bit about innovation. Um, and first off, uh, you know, and, and also about what we've been at HEAT have been working on for the last few years, which is starting uh, a new kind of utility. Um, so I'm trying both conversations. This is, these are some, some of the first times I've presented on this, so please bear with me. Um, first off, I should say HEAT, the nonprofit that I co-founded and am a co-executive director at, uh, does not take any funding from industry. Uh, whether geothermal or gas or any other, we get funded by donors and by private foundations so that everybody can trust us and some also by government support. So uh, innovation um, and, and what we care about at, at HEAT is systems change. So it's not just coming up with, with an invention in some way, but working slowly to change the entire system. Um, so, I thought I'd point out a few ways in which that can happen, uh, and what works for me, I guess. Um, so first off is you want to remain open to, the, to different ideas, to big possibilities, and have sort of a child's mind, and not assume you know the answer to anything. And uh, in terms of what heat does, what we care about is carbon emissions. We want to reduce carbon emissions uh, and actually reverse climate change. So the, what we do is we look for really big problems with no effective actors, um, and that are deeply interesting to us, because if you're not interested, you're not gonna have the energy to keep following the problem uh, forward. And so I'm gonna give you a variety, I'm gonna show you step by step how different things have happened uh, to let you to let us get to the point where we're beginning to start a whole new utility which so far as I know has not happened in a hundred years so this was the big problem because remember I said that we looked for big problems and this came along I think in 2014 uh, this was a, a paper that was at in the Boston, you know, a research paper that was uh, pointed out in the Boston Globe by uh, Nathan, um, <laughs> where he had driven uh, the streets of Boston with a high precision natural gas analyzer and found over 3,000 gas leaks. And up until that point, Heat had been working on energy efficiency and had not looked at natural gas in any way. But there was one line in this paper that said that the amount of gas emitted basically erased all of the state's energy efficiency programs. And those were just in from the gas leaks in Boston alone. And so that focused my attention because that means it's a big problem in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, and the reason why 
meth natural gas is so important is because if it's leaked out before it's burned, it is uh, emitted as methane, which is very different than carbon dioxide. If this blanket is a blanket of carbon dioxide, then one, you know, and it's a one pound, one unit of, of carbon dioxide, then methane, unit for unit, is 84 times worse on a 20-year time frame. It's that it would warm the blank uh, the world that much more from the you know unit to unit right pound to pound if that makes sense. So uh, I threw myself into looking at natural gas leaks, trying to figure out what effective action I could take to reduce these emissions. And whenever you do that, the important thing is to uh, talk to all pro uh, all stakeholders, learn everything. Learn the motivations, learn the restrictions until you can, you know, until you're starting to just learn the same stuff over and over again, until there's nothing new to learn. Um, and so I like went out on gas leak patrols. I found out that gas leaks killed trees. Uh, I drove around in the car with the natural gas analyzer. I read lots of papers. Um, and while you're doing this, if you are working at a nonprofit, you want to minimize costs at the same time. That's an important thing. <laughs> so don't spend money, you know, in crazy ways at this point. Um, and you want to always talk to all stakeholders and listen hard again for their motivations and their restrictions. What can they do? Why do they think they can do it? What do they care about? What can't they do? Who's in the way? Um, and you want to build relationships of trust because all social change happens through relationships. And we forget that, right? We think if we come up with a good idea that it'll just happen, but it won't unless, you, unless everybody's listening to you and trusting you. Um, so we did, we, with, with Nathan and, and Bob Ackley, we did, a variety, we did surveys in Cambridge and in Somerville. And we shared the information with, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we surveyed Cambridge and Somerville, analyzed the information, wrote it up in reports, shared it with the city staff. And uh, while doing that, I noticed that the most, the thing that they, everybody paid attention to was seeing the gas leaks like this. From that point on, I could see their brains shift. They understood methane as a different problem and a different sort of scope. Um, and so uh, that, I thought, was the leveraged action. If I could get people to do that, I would change the way everybody thought about gas leaks. But I couldn't get poor Bob to drive across the whole state, right? That would be too much. So uh, someone in the group that we, I was working with, because by then we had a sort of coalition, pointed out that there was some state data on a, a very arcane website um, that had showed uh, information about gas leaks. And so I looked up that data, and uh, it, was, it was hundreds of pages. <laughs> and, uh, but on those hundreds of pages, there was this, which had uh, the, the actual addresses of the gas leaks. And I thought, huh, I wonder if I could map all of those hundreds of pages of addresses. Um, so I tried it out. Uh, I started off uh, with the city of Cambridge, and I mapped all the, all the gas leaks in Cambridge. And I would show it to different people. And every one of them, first thing they would do is they'd zoom into their home or their kid's school or their business. And I could see that same change. I could see that their brain had grasped the problem in a totally different way. It's a very local problem that was still very global, right? So I began to iterate and to map different towns using, again, that same utility-reported state data. Uh, and when, when I had all, I think it was like 250, maybe 300 towns mapped, uh, I sent it as in a press release to the Globe. And I got a front page story above the fold. And over 50 other 
uh, press stories, some of which were uh, national. Um, so this was an effective action. The question is now, I'd gotten everybody's attention. What did I want them to do? Um, so I started playing with the data in different ways. One of the things I noticed was that the gas leaks the, were, had uh, you know, dates beside them, right? So the dates of discovery when they were first found by the utility. So I was like, huh, I wonder which one's the oldest gas leak. And I uh, looked, and it turned out to be one 30-year-old leak in, uh, down, you know, in Boston. And so we had a birthday party for it. Of course, we didn't light the candles. <laughs> and uh, we got, again, some press for that. But in response, all the utilities did was fix that one leak. That's not the kind of systems change we're looking for, right? So we began to try again different things. There was a one, uh, one event where people figured out that gas leaks kill trees, right? So they started making these beautiful scarves and wrapping them around trees, uh, showing which ones were dying. But nobody really cared about that. So we had a leaky lemonade stand because uh, consumers have to pay for the gas that leaks out. So the kids would sell the, <laughs> the lemonade with holes pump, you know, in the bottom. And, but that, that didn't take off either. So <laughs> then uh, Mothers Out Front in Cambridge uh, with Zena Magavi uh, started labeling tagging the gas leaks. They would put these signs up in front of every gas leak in Cambridge. That got press. That got people's attention. That got legislators interested. So this, this one took off. And now we began to have more and more uh, presentations and talks and more and more groups being interested in supporting the idea, but we still didn't know what actions we wanted, right? Because we couldn't have the utilities fix every gas leak in the entire state, right? It would take too long, it would cost too much, it would use a lot of concrete, which is not exactly a low greenhouse ga gas material, right? It, it, it takes energy. Um, and we, we started talking to legislators, but again, we, were, we didn't know quite what we wanted to ask for. And I'll just point out, if you want to do systems change, the most important thing you have to know, again, is how to resolve problems, because there are always problems. And at this point, uh, the board for HEAT, that nonprofit that I work at, they actually told me that this is not what we, we should be doing, and the board nearly came apart. Um, but there's always problems. And so what you have to do is search for alignment, figure out a way to get everybody to head in the same direction. That's the really hardest, the part, hardest part. Um, so this was when alignment happened. Um, there was a paper that was uh, written uh, on which uh, Nathan is actually, a, you know, the lead author, senior author, is that what is it called? Last author. Last author. Um, and it showed that just 7% of the gas leaks emis emitted half of all the gas. So if we can find and fix those 7% of the leaks, these super emitting gas leaks, we'd cut the emissions in half quickly and for a little cost, right? So boom, this is what we want to ask for. Uh, within two months of this paper being passed, we had that law, which is just stunning. <laughs> um. So, Good, I'm all done, right? But unfortunately, sometimes change takes, is, takes more than that. So again, the point is to be open. Look for the problems again, the big problems with no effective ac actors, right? Here is the big problem. The Department of Public Utilities is the one who decides how the law gets enacted, that one of finding the big gas leaks. And they decided that probably the best way to do it would be to do just a single point measurement using 
this, uh, this thing here. So you pu put the, the probe in over the gas leak, and if it detects over 50% of gas, then that would be a big gas leak. It was 50%, right? And uh, I thought, that's ridiculous, because it's the same as like, you know, it's just one single point. So if you put it right over the gas leak, it might be 100%, but it might be a teeny leak, right? <laughs> And so we didn't know if this would work. And the worst thing in the world would be if they used this idea, this method, and identified leaks that were the wrong leaks, repaired them, and told everybody that the problem was solved. That would be horrible. So this was a problem. So when you have a problem, you always go to the people who can solve the problem. And so if I were working on trying to reduce the number of guns in the country, who should I go to? NRA, right? So in this case, I was trying to solve the problem around gas. I go to the gas utilities. Um, and this is actually, you know, the, the president of Columbia Gas. And so I started talking to him first. Um, and I learned as much as I can about his procedures, what he cared about, how he was paid, where he was regulated, what, what the problems were, why they would want to use that, say, that method to identify big gas leaks, the super emitting leaks. And I came up with this idea, like, why don't we test? Try out different methods to see which is most effective at identifying those super emitting gas leaks. And so we would test that method that the department suggested versus uh, the, mes the method of that mobile, the, the PACARO, which is a mobile natural gas analyzer. And we'd test that against another method called the leak extent method in a, in a scientific study. And so I had to persuade the gas utilities to do that. So I persuaded uh, Steve from uh, Columbia Gas and he talked Eversource uh, Gas into joining. That's Bill Akeley there. National Grid was a little harder. So we had to uh, do a demonstration where we dressed a lot of people up as big gas leaks in orange and uh, got a Twitter storm through mothers out front. Oh, sorry. And uh, finally got the meeting with National Grid. And you can, do they look uncomfortable or not? So we did the study with the utilities. And uh, the leak extent method actually worked. And the utilities by this point were bought in. They saw how hard we worked. And uh, they totally supported the idea that this should be the method to identify those super emitting leaks, especially since science now showed that it was the best way. And so we got regulation passed. And I'll add one, one small detail here, that when we asked the, the Department of Public Utilities to enact this is the appropriate method, uh, there were some uh, people from Columbia Gas who were supposed to testify to the DPU that this was the way, you know, the me right method. But they were in Ohio the day before and there was a terrible snowstorm. So they drove all night to get back. They arrived like caffeinated up the gills, giggly as, as anything, and ready to testify because they said they couldn't disappoint us because they saw how hard we worked and how much we cared about it. And that's the kind of, when you get alignment, when you work with people right, you get people do, you know, on your side, even when you think they might not be on your side in the beginning. So good, I'm all done now, right? Everything's solved. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, immediately we figured out there was another problem. The gas utilities were, sp I, I downloaded uh, data about the utilities from the Department of Public Utilities website and I found out that they're spending, over the next 20 years, they would be spending about $9 billion on installing new gas mains. And that's crazy because we have a state mandate to you know, go to net zero emissions, man, you know, by 2050. So this would be spending $9 billion of gas customer money that our kids and our grandkids would have to spend, or would have to pay for, um, 
to install stuff that they would not be able to use. So this seemed insane to me. This was a big problem. And so I started mapping it, because I love mapping. And this is <laughs> National Grid's uh, uh, pipe replacement, gas pipe replacement for the next five years alone. Um, and I began to look at specific streets. How much was it going to cost? So with seven houses, it was going to cost over $100,000. The question is, what else could you do with that $100,000 that might uh, deliver them heating and meet their needs, right? That would not end up being stranded assets, not end up being something that our kids and our grandkids would have to pay for that they couldn't use. Currently, the state, in terms of heating, assumes we should all go to Airshore's heat pumps, which are incredibly lovely things, right? And the, the strategy is whatever we do, we have to go to electricity, because then we can produce that electricity with renewable energy. Um, so th this is the, the current strategy. And the problem with, in terms of gas is that uh, one by one, you would have customers getting off the gas system and uh, with fewer and fewer customers on that system and the system still the same size, it's still gonna cost the same amount of money to operate and maintain, right? So with each person getting off the system, the, the, the energy bill for the remaining gas customers is gonna rise until the last people left on it are gonna be only the low income and the renters. Right, the people who cannot switch out their heating system. And that's not the sort of just transition we want. Uh, here's one uh, report by E3 about how that might go. So that top, that top one is what happens if we all move one by one to, you know, off the gas system. Our ener the energy bill will just go crazy. So instead, Heat suggested, you know, that my nonprofit suggested that we should go to what's, what we're now calling networked geothermal and have it be installed by the gas utilities. Um, and the reason why is because then we could just do, everybody could still stay as a gas customer with the, you know, gas utility, even though we'd really be thermal customers and be part of a thermal utility. And, and so in this case, the transition would go more like this, where an entire street would go to geo. And it, it's a network ground source heat pump, so it's not like deep geo. It's a few hundred feet deep. Um, it's, it's the same as a single building install of ground source heat pumps, except for you're networking them together with a pipe filled with water. And I'm not going to get technical about it. <laughs> if you want, I can. Um, but so all of these people could still then be in that same rate base, that same customer group paying for both the gas system and the geo system. And that way you would not have the fewer and fewer customers maintaining the same system of the same size. If that makes sense. Yeah, question in the back. Sorry? Yes, it's all, it's all new infrastructure. No, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be reusing the same gas mains because the energy, the energy density of water is very different than the energy density of gas, and so you'd have a different size pipe. Um, and it's also a closed loop system, so it's not like you're reusing water all the time. It's ambient temperature, so it's not heat, you know, hot, hot water or anything like that. And if it ever leaks, all you do is water trees, right? That's a s small joke. So we did a statewide feasibility study to find out if it would work. Um, and it turns out it would work, and I won't get into that part, but uh, it can meet all the energy needs we have for the vast majority of the gas infrastructure in the state. And anybody can find the feasibility study on, the Heat, on Heat's website. Um, it would also share energy between buildings. So one building, for instance, an office building, might take a lot of uh, cooling, even in the middle of the winter, because of all the computers in the building. Um, and then return the water into the system 
a little hotter, right, because it had taken the cooling off. And that heat could then be used by other buildings down the street. Um, you can also store energy, for instance, heat in the bedrock uh, during the summer when you have lots of it. And then pull it out during the winter. Um, and I just want to clarify again, this is not the same as other types of geothermal, right? It's not going deep down into lava. It's not creating electricity. It's not creating only heat that's being sent out by a district, you know, a central plant. And it's not a single building install of ground source heat pump. It's networked. And so shallow, it's in the right of way of the street. The gas utilities already have the right of way of the street. Um, and uh, so they already have the customers, they already have the financing, it'd be way better for them to install this stuff. Because then our if our kids and our grandkids are paying for it, 50, you know, 50 years from now, they'll actually still be able to use it. Because it, it would be utterly non-emitting, right? Because there's no combustion of any kind. Uh, so we started having all these charrettes, where, which were like stakeholder meetings and uh, working again through, through trust and iterating constantly, trying to surface what the problems were uh, and solve for them in these charrettes. And uh, to give you uh, this one, there was uh, in this uh, one charrette, there was uh, somebody who'd gone on a variety of hunger strikes against gas peaker plants for you know, up to 30 days. And uh, there was also uh, gas utility executives and um, the person who came, uh, the gas union, uh, you know, leaders, and uh, also um, the person who came up with gas is the bridge, clean bridge fuel, was in this group, like everybody, all together. So we work with a wide, wide range of people, which is incredible. Um, and we also started publishing a lot of, you know, peer-reviewed papers on different parts, not only with network geothermal, but other things, so that we work in the safe space of science, so everybody still trusts us. Um, so what would the outcomes be of this network geothermal system? First, it would be safer. And we've been in Massachusetts, maybe, maybe I don't know how many of you experienced or remember the Merrimack Valley gas disaster, but it was pretty crappy. Um, it would also result in lower energy bills uh, because Applied Economics Clinic did this, uh, you know, sort of predicted the energy bills. If the system were uh, installed by the gas utility and depreciated in, a, in the normal way they depreciate all gas infrastructure, the, then it would be this, you know, the, basically the cost would go down because about currently 50% of your energy bill is for fuel, the actual gas. And so there'd be no more gas. So that would be taken away, and you'd be using only a small, minimal amount of electricity. Uh, and that would be the only fuel cost, right? So that's why the bills are lower. Um, and for any of you who care about the electric peaks, um, if we're all moving all of our building's energy use, especially our heating, to electricity, then um, those electric peaks are going to increase a lot. Right? So here we have the annual uh, electric peak use from buildings. And you can see sort of the bump up where we all turn our, our AC on. Here's what would happen in the future as we move all of our buildings to electricity based on different ways we could do that. So that top one is if we all move to electric baseboard, which would be a very inefficient way of doing it. Um, and instead, and it looks sort of like a falcon with its wings up high, right? But if we do it uh, with air source heat pumps, much more efficient, those wings are beginning to come down. And then if we do it instead at the bottom with networked geothermal, because it's the most efficient system we know of, the, the wings are beginning to land. And so this, you know, peak energy use is actually, it's the most expensive energy use and it's the dirtiest, because that's when they turn on all the peaker plants. That's when they turn on the dirtiest fuel they have. So the more we can bring those electric peaks down, the cleaner and the less expensive we, the energy is, and also the faster we can transition. And the, you know, the less expensive overall that transition will be. So this is important. Um, another lovely thing about it is that gas workers can actually transition because this is the same type of pipe 
uh, as, you know, the gas is. The water pipes are the same. So they are already certified to maintain the system. And finally, of course, there'd be lower emissions. It'll be about 60% lower immediately based on Massachusetts electric grid fuel mix in comparison to any building connected to gas. And as we go forward into the future where we source more and more of our electricity from renewables, those emissions will decline further. Eversource <laughs> actually already got approved to install one of these. And it's got the test boreholes in, and uh, the system should be turned on this summer. And uh, National Grid uh, has four different installations approved, which is just thrilling. Um, and I'll say that uh, the first site will be in Lowell, uh, speaking of factories and innovation. Um, <laughs> and um, they will be, every building connected to the system will, uh, they'll take all the gas appliances out and, and replace them with electric appliances. So nation uh, National Grid, a gas utility, will be performing electrification in these buildings, which is just amazing to me. And there's further progress in states across the country of different installations funded or legislation proposed or feasibility studies, and there's more. And we, we came up with this idea in 2017, so this progress is amazing. There's now an actual coalition of gas utilities that are meeting regularly to try to figure out, you know, more about networked geothermal. And uh, there's, I think, you know, we met with them yesterday to tell them some of the information we have, which is just so strange to go from such a sort of combative relationship with gas utilities to where they are actively asking f for more information. Um, and these, you know, there's a variety of them that are about to install pilots or are installing pilots. And we consider them more demonstration installations because we know the technology works, right? There's colleges that use this technology across the country. There's also a national advocacy, advocate coalition too, where they're pushing for legislation or policy changes uh, across the country. And so all of this leads me to this. Are we at the point where we have potentially the birth of a new utility? I mean, we've had, you know, as utilities, we've had gas, we've had electricity, uh, we've had a variety of other ones, water, and so could we now be at the point where we're about to have a thermal utility? And this picture shows you what happened when telephones and electricity first started, right? It was unregulated. Everybody and their mother got in there starting companies and throwing wires everywhere. Um, and the service would be imperfect, uh, you know, uneven. And it was hard to have all the infrastructure in the street for all these different private companies. So what always happens in the start of a utility is it begins after a while first to uh, sort of the bigger ones buy up the smaller ones. And then secondly, it begins to get regulated. So what might happen in terms of that? So first, first there would have to be an innovation phase. And in this one, everybody could install it, right? gas utilities, developers, et cetera. And what you'd do is you'd install it in a street, back the gas up out of that street, connect all the buildings, and, and these would be called pilots, even though I like demonstration installation. Um, and during that time, you would maximize learning in order to enable trust from all stakeholders. Because if we don't have trust, then the regulators won't approve it, and the gas utilities won't install it, and the developers won't install it, and the customers won't want it. You always have to have trust. Oh, and so here in Massachusetts, HEAT will be leading a research team with two national labs and MIT and others uh, to be able to make sure that everybody understands everything we can about these first few installs and knows, you know, understand how to do it better next time 
and to make sure to get trust and share information as widely as possible. Um, and during this point, you'd probably do measuring and, and figure out how to measure it, how to be, uh, meter it and bill, it, and bill for it, right? Because you could do either BTUs, or you could do gallons of water, or you could do the size of the, the building. And then you would uh, start to iterate and make, uh, you know, interconnect, because each of these systems can interconnect, same as like Lego blocks, right? Uh, and you'd do it through a merged gas geo rate base so that you wouldn't have those stranded assets. Um, and the thing that I personally worry about a lot is um, how you do this best. So one of, the, one of the difficulties is how to pay for the building retrofits, because there'd have to be some retrofits. You'd have to have a new heating, you know, heat pump switched out for your boiler or your furnace. You'd probably have to switch out other appliances. You'd have to pay for, you know, in, uh, upgrade the electric panel probably. There'd be some changes. And so how do you pay for these? And one possible way is through the Inflation Reduction Act, and, uh, you know, uh, which has an enormous amount of investor tax credits, and there's also some very low interest uh, loans available for the, from the Loan Program Office of the Department of Energy. And so we hope that that might be a way to take those cost savings and direct them towards the building retrofits. We did a very fast analysis showing that there would be about $16,000 per unit available if they just got the low cost uh, money from the loan program office and directed the cost savings towards building retrofits. I mean, you'd have to make gas and thermal service equivalent and you know, you'd have to be able to allow new, uh, new customers to be served through thermal service. Um, and you'd have to accelerate the depreciation of gas infrastructure, which means that like, they couldn't keep charging our kids <laughs> for the, the gas pipes that they've installed past, say, 2050, past the point at which gas would no longer be legal. And then in the end, you'd have a sort of mature system. And at that point, potentially, you'd have uh, gas, maybe hydrogen, green hydrogen used only, uh, you know, created and used on site, right, so it's not being sent through the pipelines. As, uh, and it's either used at potentially as, at industrial sites, where they have, for, for instance, glass smelting, which you can't really do with heat pumps, um, or potentially it's used as supplemental backup heat for the system. But those are the only ways, you know, the, the only points, I think, at which you'd want to use combustion. But we, we believe in being realistic, so I think there would have to be some combustion. If all that happens, then all the sites that would you know, are currently slated to be new fossil fuel infrastructure sites um, can instead become future sites where renewable infrastructure can be installed. Um, and I think that that's the end of the presentation. So any questions? So the mic is back here, and this gentleman had his hand raised first, and you can pass it around. Um, hi, I'm Chris from North Andover, so I was um, not deeply impacted by the uh, Merrimack gas explosions, but it motivated um, our family to move off natural gas, shut off the meter, and um, with solar use of air to a water heat pump. Um, I was curious about one of the slides and a statement you made about moving slowly. <laughs> sure feels like we need to move as fast as we possibly can. So to the customer, it looks like the cost is about half. And how do the companies like stay profitable and motivated to, you know, function as an entity? Um, have have you got a long way to go on the financing, figuring that out, and the depreciation, or do you feel like you're almost there? Um, so even though the customer bills would be much lower, and. Uh, um, Gas utilities actually, their profit doesn't come by selling the fuel. That's just a pass-through cost. Their profit comes from installing new infrastructure. So, uh, in this, if they installed this system, they would have lots and lots of profit because they would have to install a lot of systems. Um, and so, that's partly why they're interested. A um, couple of comments. Mm -hmm. um, my experience in New England has and, been. That and wait, I should point out that this is a uh, 
heat pump expert, a uh, ground source heat pump expert, uh, that, no. uh, you know, incredibly well known. So let's just, I'm scared. <laughs> My experience in New England is that drilling costs here are more expensive than down in DC, and I'm not sure why nobody's been able to explain that. There's a new high-powered company called Dandelion Energy that's trying to get into this, and they may be able to get the drilling costs down. A question, have you looked into tying solar thermal into uh, your ground source heat pump network, perhaps by heat exchangers off the back of photovoltaic collectors? Mm. Um, so I'm going to break that into the two questions. One is the cost here in, in Massachusetts. And so uh, it's not a very developed industry, uh, the drilling, you know, the geothermal drilling industry or the ground source heat pump industry. Uh, and so the expenses are a little higher here. Um, and there's a lot of things that can be done to improve that. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a state by state sort of patchwork of, of what uh, the accreditations around who can drill. And so I've talked to drillers who have to like, they either can drill in Massachusetts or Florida and, or New York and not a lot of other places in between. And so it's been, you know, it increases the cost considerably to have to sort of move uh, their giant drill rig from one place to another in order to work all the way through the year. Um, but also, there's, the, the, the drilling industry just needs to be increased quite considerably in order to drive down costs. And uh, transportation of the drill is one of the most expensive things. So if you're drilling straight down the street, that should really create sort of economies of scale. Um, and we hope over time that those costs go way down. Uh, the second thing of solar thermal, I would love that. And solar thermal is like where instead of creating electricity, you use uh, the sun to create heat. Um, yeah, you can buy a heat exchange that slaps on the back of your, so yes. your solar yeah, uh, photovoltaic the, yeah. outfit here in Massachusetts called Sun Drum. And they're a little pricey right now, but uh, they, they have possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think solar thermal and every other kind of, uh, there's whole, a lot of different industries that could be connected into this. So uh, that would be one thing that I'd really like. Another one would be the idea of uh, wind turbines. The times at which the wind is the strongest is generally at night and in the fall. And that's when people don't necessarily, are, you know, they don't have their lights on. They aren't using a lot of electricity. So it would be lovely to take all that wind energy and uh, pump it as heat, using heat pumps, into the ground in the fall. And then you have the, you know, the heat that you need stored up for the winter. So I think there's just a lot of different ways that this could interconnect with other technologies. Hi, Audrey. Hey. Um, <clears throat> can you go into more detail about what would actually have to happen to merge the two rate bases and changes to GSEP? And I'm, I'm, I know, you know a lot about Massachusetts, but I'm wondering how you generalize that to other states. and any more detail that you would have about it? Yeah, so in Massachusetts, um, I think, you know, uh, regulators or legislators could say that the, the rate basis should be one single uh, rate base. But I think, uh, you know, and it depends on how brave the regulators are. And generally, regulators don't ever want to get out ahead of legislators. So generally, it has to be legislators. Um, and I think that that would have to be true probably in each state. Um, and again, the reason why I want to do that is just because I don't want, I, I don't, you know, I want to radically reduce emissions, but I don't want to do it in a way that low income have to pay for. I think that'd be terrible. So a lot of states have something like, I'm sorry, a lot of states have something like a GSEP program, the Gas Safety Enhancement Program. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I've, my instinct is that you have to change that first before you can even talk about merging the rate basis? Um, yeah, so in, uh, the, the GSEP plan uh, just mentioned, the gas system enhancement plan mentioned, is the plan, the name of the plan that we use to install new gas infrastructure in re to replace the old gas infrastructure. Um, and by the way, some of our gas pipes date back to President Lincoln, and they're still in use. Um, so you get, that gives you an idea. 
<laughs> um, uh, I think each state, it's going to be different, you know, like some states, they don't have leak prone ga aging gas pipes because it's all new development, right? They only, you know, it's not that old a state. Um, but there, there'll always be places where you can do avoided gas infrastructure costs. Like in those cases, they'd be doing new developments. You don't want those new developments to be on gas, right? Not if we're going to reduce emissions. Um, and so in those, yes, investment would have to be allowed. This is the short version of the answer. <laughs> investment would have to be allowed to go into, uh, you know, being installed instead of inst putting more money into fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and that might be one of the first things, but each state will have to decide on their own how to do it best. New York State just passed a law a few months ago where every utility, they skipped all of these steps, right? They just decided every utility not only can be a thermal utility, but must be a thermal utility. And they mandated the seven biggest had to install new installations, I think in this year. Um, so they are jumping way over Massachusetts in that. This is all very fascinating and I I'm only learning about it tonight for the first time, so I'm processing a lot. But it strikes me that if the economic, and, and very much in favor of this whole thing, um, that if the economics are such that a utility, a gas utility, could make a profit without having to sell a fossil fuel, that the economics could work for anybody to compete against the gas utilities. There's no reason this has to, I mean, it happens to be that the gas utilities are the ones we're trying to replace, so it's nice to give them an alternative source of income. But the reality is this could be a very competitive world where you're competing to sell infrastructure maintenance, infrastructure installation and maintenance, right? And it's nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And it could bring the cost down even more, potentially. Do you think, what do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so I, th I love competition. Um, uh, Marilyn loves you right now. Um, but I, I personally love competition. There is something, though, uh, called a natural monopoly. Um, and that's, that's the idea that when, when something, when there's really expensive infrastructure, and again, you know, where, where it has to be in the street, uh, and where it serves multiple customers, and where it's very important to regulate it for safety or quality or something along those lines, that's when you get to what's called a natural monopoly. And so that's why we don't have 100 uh, electricity companies in each municipality or 1,000 water utilities. That's, what, that's, that's the way our society has gone. Um, and so in this case, I think sooner or later, we're going to get away from that telephone pole with all the, elect the electric wires and telephone wires or whatever they were, and we're going to go to you know, more of a monopoly. But there might be a little bit of a wild, wild west on the way there. And I, I sort of encourage, even though I want gas utilities to do this, I think one of the best ways to do it is by having a bit of competition to scare the bejesus out of them so they move forward a little faster. We got to know over here, so we're uh, going to all have fisticuffs later. Yeah. Audrey, I wanted to say what impresses me most about this is that you managed to take the gas utilities and not turn them into the bad guys and to be able to, to treat them as people who are trying to deal. And I think that was brilliant, and I wish we could all mo model ourselves on you. Th thank you. He, he's not a plant. <laughs> We're going to get one back. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I heard you talk about. Uh, going into existing cities, neighborhoods, taking out the gas stoves, the gas ranges, taking out the gas water heaters, the gas furnaces, and putting in heat pumps, electric stoves, electric water heaters. If you go into a large area like that, electrical demand is certainly gonna skyrocket. Mm -hmm. So do we have to look at upgrading the electrical infrastructure and also the capacity to feed that electrical infrastructure? Um, yes, um, and so the question is, how do we do it? How, how much do we have to, how efficiently we do that electrification? 
has a big impact on the electric peaks as well as how much the electric grid must be increased to deal with those peaks. So that's why we believe networked geothermal might be one of the best ways forward because it is the most efficient method. And yes, if we electrify everything, the electric grid is gonna have to be transformed quite considerably. Um, but this method can help make that transformation less expensive and faster. And uh, we need it to go faster. My eldest son was born in the year 2000. And uh, that, so I can easily translate in terms of scientific predictions how old he will be when each of those scientific predictions come true when cl with climate change. And it scares the crap out of me. So I, I just, I think we really have to go forward fast and inexpensively. I'd just like to make a... Uh, Oh, microphone? Yep. Yeah. Um, Give one second and then, and then we'll go. Yep. Um, thank you for the presentation and, you know, the uh, potential to, to have this transformation happen so quickly is really interesting. I'm curious, as a relative, you know, newbie to this world, what kind of risks, limitations, et cetera, there might be with sort of rolling this out at scale and how um, you're thinking about measuring, identifying, and mitigating those? Yeah, that's, that's uh, thank you, it's a great question and it scares the crap out of me also along with, you know, children, <laughs> the impact on children in the future. Um, but that, that's partly why we're having that large scientific team to, to research the first few installations they will be to make sure that we learn as much as possible from the first installations to make sure that we can go forward in the fastest, best way possible. And so there will be uh, studies on everything from the impact on uh, the trees to uh, the emissions reductions to the in, in, you know, improvement in public health to uh, there will be an optimization model. So they'll, they'll make something that will basically mirror what the system is and try to figure out how to design it better. And it will learn with every installation so that we'll be able to decrease the infrastructure as much as possible and design it in the best way possible. So we're going to be doing, and we're going to make uh, apples to apples normalized data bank so that anybody can look at the data and figure out what the best practices are. Because that's the only way we're all going to you know, go forward in this without making a lot of stupid mistakes. Instead, we'll make just a few, hopefully. Fingers crossed. And, that, and, and so that, that's the best answer I have. If you have other ideas, I'd love to have them, you know, to hear them. Uh, um, I'm an innovator in electric generation and utilization of power plant heat. When the generation of electricity was deregulated here in New England, there were pious hopes that it would bring new types of power plants and new technologies. If you look at the record, all of the entrepreneurs are, uh, have bought the same type of plant from the same two major vendors or three major vendors, almost identical in design, and then they're all scrambling to get the cheapest gas they can and so on a really cold day, there's trouble because we don't have the pipeline capacity and these people to be competitive won't reserve pipeline capacity and so to keep the lights on, the power pool's running the old, relatively inefficient oil-fired plants and some of the really old plants have burned heavy fuel, the most polluting kind. So uh, competition is, I think, overrated because the real innovators don't get rewarded. Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a, a good response to that. It's, it's hard to know always how, to, how much competition to have and, and what, what makes it best. But in general, I believe a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of competition helps make things better. Hi, uh, thank you again. Uh, have kind of 
more logistical type questions. So I, I work for a GC in the area. Um, so I've done a couple like geo uh, ground loop uh, systems related to buildings, and I guess I'm wondering what shallow means. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I did an auditorium building where you know that's 60 wells; they were 500 feet, and it is it's it takes up an area. The even when we do piles in in Boston, you know, um, the groundwater management and just treating of all the water with the drilling process is a big concern, and I'm just picturing that going down the middle of a street is intensive, and I guess just what, how big the well field for a neighborhood really, really is, just kind of from that aspect. I don't know if the, the I don't want to use the term pilot because I don't like it, but those pilot projects, like what, what they kind of look like. And then if I could add, just, mm -hmm. just from a workforce that, you know, that's something across the industry, I don't know, do the gas companies, is there the, the, the availability in the trades to, do this over even the next 20 years? And like, mm -hmm. is that ambitious just with the dwindling workforce? Uh, two great questions. Um, so when we did our feasibility study, we limited the borehole depth to 500 feet deep. Um, and we're, using that depth, we're able to meet the uh, aggregated, you know, the aggregated hourly peak uh, of thermal, you know, thermal needs, both heating and cooling. Uh, by neighborhood, and so you should you should take a look at the feasibility study on the heat website um, and see what you think of it. Um, but and that's partly because when you have a single building install, what you're doing is going for peak heating or cooling use. So in this area, we use more heating than we do cooling. So you're going for the very worst coldest hour, uh, and, you know, and and trying to make sure that you don't get what's called thermal drift which means that gradually as you pull more heating out of, the cold, out of the ground, the ground gets colder and colder and your heat pump begins to work less and less efficiently over time as the ground gets colder because it has to struggle more to pull that heat out. In this case, you're trying for mixed energy, uh, you know, you're trying for balance instead of peak. So you're trying to put together, uh, you know, an ice rink, an office building, you know, whatever, and a lot of homes so that they balance each other out over time. And then you're also managing, therm, you know, you're doing thermal active management so that you're, if you begin to, for instance, get, create too much cold in the ground, because here we'd be using more heating, then cold in this climate is not a problem, right? Not with climate change. You can dump it into rivers during the summer to bring them back to that pre-climate change temperature. Um, uh, and if you get too much heating, you can do other things with it, such, such as warm irrigation water during the shoulder months so that you can keep your lawns warmer for longer, or greener for longer. So there's, there's just, you, you think in a different way if you're doing a networked system rather than a single big building install. And your second question was about installers <laughs> and the whole workforce. Whatever we do, in moving towards this new, you know, towards building electrification, it's gonna take a hell of a lot of people, a huge workforce. Uh, not only the, you know, to, to install all the new heating systems, but the uh, electric stoves, the, the electric panel upgrades, it's gonna be intense. We did a fast analysis based on the Columbia gas disaster and found that I think, if I remember correctly, it would be about uh, 20,000 work, uh, workmen to just replace, and I'm probably getting this really wrong, just replace the gas system statewide and they'd be working for the next 20 years. So we're talking about a scaling of workforce that we haven't seen in a long time. But I will give you the story that uh, this has happened before with the gas utilities. When we went from uh, natural gas to fracked gas, we had to replace all the regulators on every stove and every appliance across the country. And in order to do that, in, in New York City alone, they did it in just three years. Ma manufactured gas to, oh sorry, yes, thank you. Ta for what's called tone, town gas to natural gas, yes. Thank you, correction from the audience. Um, that's, that's what happened, and there's actually a Monty Python skit about that uh, when it happened in England. Uh, you should look it up at some point. Um, it's sort of funny. Yeah. Um. Hi, I've got the mic. Sorry, I <laughs> um, keep doing that. A comment on, 
how desperately we need to increase grid capacity. I think that's a little bit overblown. Um, a lot of capacity can be added by making the grid smarter so your heat mm -hmm. pump isn't on the same time that your clothes dryer is on yes. and more sophisticated stuff. Um, so that, that seems to be a, a concept that maybe is a little bit greenwash, like there's a certain group that's running with it and not, not in a helpful way. <laughs> but um, Yeah, and have you seen Sense at all? It's a really cool tool that helps manage uh, electric use in each building but go ahead yep i own sense and emporia so they're, they're both great okay but um my question was uh how do you um include healthcare data uh sa savings so recently the doe reported um we installed 15 gigawatts of solar in 2020 which was a record but to accomplish 2050 goals we need to increase that to 30 a year 30 gigawatts a year till 25 and then 60 gigawatts from 25 to 30. But if we do that, 1.1 to 1.7 trillion dollars in healthcare savings was calculated. So I'm wondering if you have some similar. Um, I just uh, maybe two weeks ago got to uh, hear Jonathan Bonacore from uh, Boston University talk about this just, you know, exactly how much how many deaths happen each year uh, because of simply oil and gas use? So um, it's it's something we're just used to, and we don't we don't think, you know, we we uh, in seeing somebody die, you never know quite why, <laughs> right? And so we don't. There, it's not like there's they 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 have a little sticky on their chest that says um, you know fossil fuel. <laughs> when they die or anything. So you, you don't know, but it, it is in the statistics that it's easy to pull out. Um, and yes, there are many, many people that die that way. And this is, if, we, if we reduce emissions, um, as we all learned during COVID, our air quality would be better and we'd be much healthier and we'd have less of what they call excess death. Um, so. Um, question from, from me. It would, I mean, A, like everyone, I think this is great. And I particularly like your systems thinking about approaching the problem, not just as a technological problem, but in a, a, a broader system. One of the pieces that strikes me as a challenge is, and it's more of a financing challenge than anything, is the investment that the consumers need to put into their homes, all of the new heat pump equipment. And I think you mentioned 16,000 odd, you know, that would need to be financed. Is that something, and we're also sitting on the Inflation Reduction Act, which is somewhat weirdly described, but um, it's, it seems like a, a unique opportunity to get legislation involved at the start that allows, whether it's the utility that partly finances some of that in terms of the rate that they charge the consumer, so ultimately it's the consumer that just pays it over time, or whether it's grants or but that seems to be one of the sort of one of the many but one of the main obstacles that this you would face is how do you finance that because it's you're asking consumers to pay real money now for a benefit later yeah so actually um thank you it's a lovely question uh, the way utilities gas utilities do things and electric utilities is they install the expensive infrastructure and then they spread that cost across all of us and over decades into the future, and that's how we get utilities. So in terms of the infrastructure in the street, this networked ground source heat pump, this networked geothermal system, that would be paid for by the utilities, and all of us would pay for it in our energy bills over time. And uh, because, you know, and as I pointed out, that cost would be lower than gas because we wouldn't have to pay for the gas, the fuel. Um, in terms of the rest, the building retrofits, yes, I think we should use the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. There's investor task, tax credits there that will reduce the cost of the infrastructure by 50%, five zero, if it's done in the appropriate way. And then secondly, there's something called Section 1706, which would allow the gas utilities or the state to get large chunks of very low cost money that then they could loan out to gas utilities or developers or municipalities or whoever uh, with the stipulation that the cost saving goes towards those building retrofits. Um, and that way the building retrofits, that's where I got that $16,000. You would then have each unit would have $16,000 with which to uh, you know, do all the work in the building approximately on average. 
if those numbers that, you know, the analysis we did was accurate. And so if that were true, with mass save also, and a few other things, that's more than enough money to get uh, the, most of the work done, if not all the work. Or that's what I hope. Does that answer it? Good. Okay. Hey, Audrey, thank you so much. Um, one thing I would just maybe add on to this gentleman's question, I don't know if it's actually true, but since we do need to get to net zero by 2050, even if we still have the pipes, the companies aren't going to be putting gas through it. They're talking about putting RNG and hydro green hydrogen through it, which we think is a terrible idea. But if they did that, my understanding is we'd have to make those kinds of retrofits in our houses anyway. So those are coming kind of regardless of which path yes. we take. So we do have to figure out how to pay for them, but I think they're, it's, that's happening. Um, I actually had a question about this chart, which I think is great. And one of the things I'm wondering is whether you all have done the analysis that compares um, if we just did air source, heat, air source heat pumps everywhere, which means we get these wings, we need to have more capital for renewable energy, et cetera, but could that be quicker and cheaper potentially? I know it doesn't save the gas companies, et cetera, but I'm just curious about that as a model going forward as opposed to the network geothermal. Uh, great question. And I'll just explain the gas utilities are currently especially National Grid, pushing hard on the idea of putting hydrogen in our pipes. And it is the smallest, most corrosive, you know, the smallest molecule, very corrosive to most leak prone infrastructures, most gas infrastructure. And uh, it's an invisible fuel. It doesn't tend to mix well with gas, so you get little bubbles of it. They're called hydrogen slugs. It's just a bad idea, you know, and then you get like this uh, much more explosive uh, fuel hitting your oven, at, so you get this premature ignition or flashback. It's a really bad idea. So just want to, and it would increase prices. <laughs> so in case you didn't know about hydrogen, um, in terms of the the other part of your question, uh, which I sorry I went way down that rabbit hole. <laughs> about oh, if so, I just learned this week. Uh, that there's now a new kind of heat pump called a, mul a multimodal heat pump, which means that you can install it and it will work as an air source heat pump uh, and at the same efficiency. And you, know, and you would do this just when your heating system went. And then at the point that they bring the geo down your street, you can then uh, change that multimodal heat pump to a geo pump and interconnect immediately. So it might be that we get the best of both worlds, because then we could transition to air source as we need to at the point that our heating system died, and then we wait for the geo to get on our street. And I'll, I'll just point out I'll be the last person because they replaced my gas main last year. <laughs> did, that, did that answer? Yeah? Uh, we have not done that analysis, and what I worry, it's hard to do because then you have to figure out how much the electric grid upgrade will cost. You have to do all the, the electric constraints on, uh, and, and work them out. You have to add renewables in there. You have to add electric storage, um, and then you have to add the air source heat pumps. And then you have to do the same thing for networked geo, so it would be a really complicated analysis if anybody wants to start it. I'm, I, you know, I'd be happy to help. Hi, Audrey. Hey. And way to go, Heat. <laughs> um, question about the demonstration projects that are about to go online. Are they all residential or are they combinations and how, how are they going to play out? Uh, so that first install in Framingham by Eversource has uh, part of a school, a firehouse, some businesses, uh, as well as uh, 40 buildings that are either single building, uh, sil single home, uh, multi market rate single homes or uh, low income multi unit buildings. And so it's a, it's a mixed energy use. And they're already trying to figure out how to uh, interconnect it and make it even bigger, which is thrilling. And in Lowell, it's the same sort of thing that there will be mixed energy use there. Uh, and it, it, uh, with luck, it, it's on a canal. So we might be able to use the canal as uh, you know, a, uh, as a sort of thermal reservoir, or you know, either a source or a sink. So, it's quite exciting. Audrey, your voice is holding up quite well. We could continue on. Yeah, for and if anybody needs to, just you know, <laughs> I'm 
I'm happy to answer as long as you want, but if you're, you know, if the chairs are uncomfortable or anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to give you the option of how, how much further you'd like to go with questions, so we can continue on if you'd like. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm happy. Let's see. Uh, yeah, okay. Sure. Just to continue our conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I have a, an air source heat pump at home, and, you know, I wish it was everything that it, you know, promised to be, but it doesn't quite keep up with the demands in the, pe the, the depths of winter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do, and I can, can see just ground source has to be that much better because the, te the temperature differential is just not that large. So unfortunately, the air source is just not, for me, at least the version we have, isn't quite keeping up with the demand. And we have pretty low demands. It's not like we're trying to heat our house up to mid-80s. Um, so that's the problem I have with air source. And uh, I'll just, you know, so air source um, uh, heat pumps work most efficiently when you keep them at the same temperature all the time, which is not the way we're used to with fossil fuel, uh, you know, with furnaces or boilers. So you don't have, you don't, you're not supposed to turn your temperature way back down at night, and um, which it drives me insane. <laughs> I have a heat pump, and I just I always want to turn the temperature down, because um, uh, that uh, and then in that case it's harder for it to come back up to temperature. It takes a while longer. It doesn't you know snap on like a like a furnace or a boiler. And yes, with ground source because the ground is always the same temperature, it's easier for it to always uh, pull temperature that you want. You know, it's not like it has to battle against you know, zero degrees outside or 100 degrees outside to pull the temperature that you want. It's always dealing with like the ground somewhere in the 50s, if that makes sense. But, and I think we need both. We need everything on the table. We need air source, we need ground source, we need every option in order to get us to where we need to go to quickly. Um, I, I'm concerned about the labor issues and I wonder, has anybody begun working with the technical high schools uh, uh, and making, I mean, I'm sure there are technical high schools that are still teaching people how to, uh, you know, install gas. Um, is, is anybody working on that at this point that you know of? So um, it, it's strange that the technical schools are much less popular than they used to be because everybody wants to be white color and not blue color. Yeah. Um, and so there are a few technical colleges out there. Uh, in terms of the, the biggest need we're going to have immediately is drillers. Uh, so uh, with these first few installations coming up, we've arranged to uh, work with a driller and uh, with a drilling company to have a training school in the backyard <laughs> of the drilling company, which I guess must be just full of holes. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that happen. Um, and that, that will be, but that will just be the beginning effort. I think there's going to have to be a lot more. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And, yeah. So I'll join your conversation on air source heat pumps. Um, on that slide, you can see that the COP, it's a measure of efficiency, is only two for air source. So they're never going to compete with ground, which is at six. Um, the other comment would be, you, you have to do a lot of work to prepare your house for air source heat pumps and get them into a um, heat load sweet spot. So if you have a cold and drafty house with single pane windows and you're trying to replace an oil burner furnace that that is so oversized it can handle all the leakiness, there's no way that an air source heat comp pump will uh, be able to compete. You really have to get, you know, highly efficient homes um, configured with primarily air sealing and then insulation. And there are some great subsidies for that, um, but Italy, I think, is the best example where they're giving people 110% of what it takes to make the switch. Like you, they give you an extra 10% just for your time. Mm -hmm. um, since I've got the mic, <laughs> uh, there are bill inserts which raise people's awareness. Like I'm using X amount of electricity versus my neighbors. But what would be really useful is I'm 
on a path year over year of reducing my total usage. And if there's any effort to, you know, make that switch, I'd, I'd offer that comment. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, a few years ago, and um, I uh, pitched an idea to a legislator that every everybody's energy bill should be uh, transparent and public information on a monthly, you know, monthly posted on a website somewhere. And uh, that'll probably piss off a variety of people, just the very idea of it. But think of what would happen then. <laughs> We'd all know, like the, the, the energy hogs would know they're an energy hog. Uh, and the energy efficiency companies would know who to help. And you could see who they've helped in the past uh, to be able to know if they are good at it. Um, I just feel like we are the Saudi Arabia of energy waste. And uh, we, we need to get on that. Um, yeah, and air, air source heat pumps, the more efficient the house, the better. So, and the, the, this, I realized it's eight, almost 8.30, so I feel bad for everybody. So this will be the last public question. And then after that, anybody who wants to stay, please stay. I'm happy to talk. Okay, last question. Right. Sorry, it's probably not going to be a good one for the last <laughs> one. But um, I mean, just to sort of clarify, I mean, I, the heat pump that we have, I mean, it meets about 80% of our needs. So it's not like it's, you know, woefully inadequate. I mean, it's mm -hmm. great. It's just that sort of peak. And it's interesting, we haven't done all of the stuff that you were talking about, oh, you should, yeah. which is primarily what drove my question around the investments that need to be made. It's just a financing question rather than a um, technological question. So mm -hmm. but anyway, I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that the heat, the air source heat pump works. So anything beyond that is going to be just that much better. Yeah, and if you haven't insulated and, you know, what's called air sealed, which really should be called just reducing drafts, because air sealing sounds like you're going to suffocate. Um, uh, but if you haven't done that sort of work in your home, you really should, because it will keep you much warmer and it'll allow the heat pump to be, you know, more effectively meet your needs. And mass save is a lovely thing. It exists across the state. It's, uh, you know, it, it offers you re lovely rebates. Strongly advise you to go to them. Okay, well, thank you, Audrey. <laughs> and stay in touch with the museum. This is the first, as you know, kickoff uh, of this Mill Talk series on infrastructure, energy, climate, and justice. And so stay tuned for some other great speakers going forward. Thank and, you. And, and thank you so much to the museum. So.